Did you know? Did you know that comedians are everywhere? Like in every country, every single one, including those authoritarian and totalitarian, spooky regimes, they are everywhere. Simply, in some of those countries, comedians live in jail. That's the big difference. So I always wondered why are dictators so scared of comedians? Like why? Um, maybe because comedy is able to produce large-scale social changes. Let's see. Um, Let's see how comedians are doing around the world. Now, there is no statistics about comedians or political satirists because people don't care about them, I guess. But there is uh, statistics about uh, freedom of speech, and comedy, political satire, is an extension of freedom of speech. So this is how the world is doing. You'll see, a uh, you s you'll see now countries here by Reporters Without Borders, in the darker colors are the places where comedians have more chances to end up in jail. Brighter countries where they're free to joke, and uh, if you Google right now, you'll find, you'll, if you Google comedians in jail, you'll find countries popping up from, from the darker regions. So, um, <clears throat> I'm really excited to be making this talk in a free country when I can freely joke without any fear for consequences. Unless, of course, I joke about a foreign head of state. <laughs> Then I'm in trouble. I know so much. So anyway, um, is comedy really that powerful? Uh, let's look at the example of Egypt. Uh, in 2011, Egypt got, got its, its first political satire show. Uh, the host was Bassem Youssef, a talented comedian. And only two years later, in 2013, Time magazine put him on the list of 100 most influential people on the planet. Earth. Yes, that's how big he got in just a couple of years. A comedian. So that's very inspiring, especially to see how comedy is being used as a tool to fight injustice, corruption, bad governance. Now, I always liked joking. Uh, as a child, I was always joking not to fight injustice or corruption, just because it was fun. I liked that. And uh, I was always told, especially given the conservative society, that, you know, you should be serious. Sergey, you need to be serious. Even my mom, you know, you're a man, you have to be serious. Stop joking, stop being a laughingstock. So I had to pretend that I'm a serious person. For 20 years, I faked being a serious person. Until one day, I came out of the closet as openly comedian. There you go, I said. I am what I am. I'm a comedian. So, the first time I realized that comedy is powerful, can be a powerful tool, was at school. We had this really scary teacher, and uh, everybody was afraid of her, and she had this authority at school, and especially in my class. And uh, children would be like really, really silent at her lessons, And there was this thick tension all the time at her classes. So one day, I did a joke comparing the teacher to a cartoon character. The joke worked. Everybody laughed, so the joke was success, and it's, it served two purposes. First, um, it destroyed the authority of the teacher forever for the class, like forever. The authority was gone. And secondly, I got suspended from the class for a while, So I realized that a good joke can, can be both funny, but also come at a good price. That was my first lesson. And then um, I realized that if I want to get into you know, political satire, there would be risks. And there are risks, especially in developing countries. In one of the countries in my region, uh, a couple of uh, great comedians did a great joke about their, their government buying a donkey from Germany, paying a lot of money By, uh, taxpayer money for the donkey, and there was a great sketch. They interviewed the donkey. The donkey said, you know, it was worth it. I'm a great donkey. You want a piece of me? You got to pay good money. So everybody laughed. Everybody loved the joke. The guys were jailed. So I knew there were risks. There are always risks around, and uh, I had to, uh, to solve two issues as I went forward. I, first of all, I wanted to joke about politics, about politicians. And secondly, I wanted to stay out of jail. I really like being out of jail. I'm an out-of-jail kind of person, you know. I, I'm outdoorsy, you know, if you want. So, um, to combine those two, I figured out this way, and this was the biggest lesson I learned over the years. Um, in order to effectively joke, you have to get everybody to laugh. 
But most importantly, people you're joking about need to laugh at the joke themselves. You have to get all the stakeholders of the joke on board. You know, when it's, when it's in politics, you have to get everybody on. So, um, what happened, uh, for example, a couple of years ago, our government bought uh, bio toilets from Europe, paying $170,000 taxpayer money to buy two bio toilets to boost tourism. And I guess I'm forgetting to mention that they did not work. From day one, there were like non-functioning toilets out there. And uh, well, actually, it's not true. One thing worked there, music. Music worked like a clock. You would get in there, there was this soft Russian pop music, you know? So basically, government spent $170,000 on a giant jukebox <laughs> for the town, for tourists. Now, you, and I have a photo of that. I actually went there a couple of days ago to make sure it's still there, and it's there. <laughs> it's right there. It's frustration you may be noticing on my face. It's been a few years. It's like a monument to bad governments still out there. So um, your first in instinct is to say something horrible. You're frustrated. They're idiots. You know, you want to call names. You want to call the government a bunch of idiots. But then, uh, and by the way, if you do that, people will love you. Trust me, there is no easier way to become loved by the general public than just by calling names to the government. But will, will that or would that help? solve the issue, change the situation. Now, um, the way to spin that story was, uh, I, I framed it this way. Dear government, uh, we're asking kindly to also install non-functioning bio jacuzzis next to those bio toilets with some rock music there, some Western music or something. So the jo joke got big, people picked it up, they were joking about it, they were joking about the government, but because it was a general joke, a joke that could involve all the stakeholders, people from the government were joking about that in the corridors themselves. So it got infectious. And eventually, some months later, the prime minister, even the prime minister admitted that probably, probably it was not a great idea to purchase those non-functioning bio toilets with that music there. So, and after that, after all that embarrassment and public pressure caused by political satire and spinning the story in that way, not a single one of those bad guys has been purchased to date. So that was one success story. And uh, then, very recent one, one of the ministries, our ministries, built a training facility and a resort for its staff. Like, you know, you, they would go get training there, and also, well, not this one, no, I'll, <laughs> nothing to show here. Um, so, uh, for training and for recreation. So, again, they spend millions of taxpayer, taxpayer dollars. I'm a taxpayer, I get angry, I want to do something about that, I want to change some, something. Again, your first instinct is to call people idiots. That's, the, that's a very normal, basic instinct that you want to go for. But then you want to you wanna go be strategic about structuring that joke. And here's how I went about that. I looked at the items they had purchased for the training facility and the recreational you know, area, and I saw that in the, in the rooms uh, of that uh, facility, they had furnished their private rooms with magnifying mirrors. They put magnifying mirrors on the walls. So it actually begged the joke. So uh, I put it this way. And so uh, the ministry has furnished their rooms with magnifying mirrors. Apparently, they like to see themselves bigger in the privacy of their rooms. Somebody is working on self-confidence in the ministry, and so the joke got big because they were, they were imagining that little innuendo that came with the joke. It was out there, everybody was imagining why, why are they using that magnifying mirrors in the rooms, the private rooms. So it was picked up, the ministry people left, trying to explain to others, no, no we don't have self-confidence issues, that, that's not what you think. So that became a story, people were sharing, and a couple of days later, the government convened a, se a session dem demanding justification for every purchased item, and the minister was like explaining why they bought this, why they bought that, and it got a big, became a big story, and things began to change there. So um, it's also supported by scientific evidence, if you like, because uh, when people laugh, especially when public officials laugh, 
there are these endorphin hormones produced in their brains, you know? They're, they're sprinkled these happiness hormones, and they become more relaxed and more inclined to changes. And uh, that, that's, uh, that's what's happening when you're, you're getting them aboard of that joke. And you have to keep in mind that in liberal societies, you can do a joke, uh, and the politician you're joking about may hear that, say, ha, 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 that's a, that's a funny joke. He may laugh at that and you know, just go have some lunch. But in a conservative society, a politician may hear a joke about himself and go, <laughs> that's a funny joke. Yeah, let's, let's go break, break that comedian's legs or something. <laughs> so you have to be strategic. Fortunately, I have been able to keep my legs safe. I only got away with a broken uh, windshield of my car, which is here. It's a German car, by the way, just <laughs> trying to get you more connected to my problems, you know. <clears throat> and, but that's fine. I'm, I'm happy to, uh, you know, to, to have that sacrifice in order to be able to continue to productively influence changes through comedy. So uh, my, my main lesson has been that when you're joking, you have to make sure you sprinkle those happiness hormones into the brains of public officials by getting them on board of the joke, getting them to laugh at the joke. From there, the change may start. That also, that and also plus remember that if you get into political satire, if you do a really, really critical joke, you know, park your car in a garage, please. Thank you very much.